A letter was published in the Financial Times calling for an immediate peace, but this clamour for a cessation of hostilities and a peace at any price deal shows blindness to Russian goals, or so it has been argued by the signatories of a counter letter that was put in the same publication, the Financial Times. I'm joined today by the author of the repost to that, James Sher, and one of the key signatories of that letter, Urysia Lutsevich. Here's a quick introduction to my expert guest today. Orisi Lutsevich is Deputy Director of the Russia and Eurasia Programme and Head of the Ukraine Forum at Chatham House. Orisi's research focuses on social change, the role of civil society in democratic transition in Eastern Europe, and most recently, democratic resilience to foreign encroachment. She is author of some fantastic research papers, which I think we will almost certainly allude to some of those in today's interview. And we will, of course, be putting links to those as well as the letters that we are referencing in the description of the video. I'm also joined by James Sher, OBE, who is an honorary fellow at the International Centre for Defence and Security in Tallinn, Estonia. He's also an associate fellow and former head of the Russia and Eurasia programme at Chatham House. He was a fellow of the Conflict Studies Research Centre at the UK Ministry of Defence and Director of Studies of the Royal United Services Institute. He has published extensively on Soviet and Russian military history, security and foreign policy, as well as energy security covering the Black Sea region, as well as Ukraine's efforts to deal with Russia and the West. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like, subscribe. And if you like this material, please do add a comment. And if you're not subscribed to Chatham House to get all the latest research, please do sign up to that as well as including, of course, the individual social profiles of Orisia and James, because they will also be publishing materials uh, that are not necessarily associated with the organizations they're part of. And those are well worth looking out for. But without further ado, welcome to the channel. Welcome back to the channel, I should say. Thank you. And do note, please, that Orisia 2 has recently received an OBE. Uh, congratulations. I was aware of that. I'm so sorry for not mentioning it. The double OBE. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It yeah. is a huge the privilege. The, hyd the Hydra. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge privilege to have Thank not you, just uh, experts, but, uh, you know, uh, experts have been rewarded for that as well. Well, let's start with the letter, because I, I saw the letter um, it immediately uh, triggered my buttons, uh, so to speak. Um, but what it seems to me is that that letter lacks some significant detail. It lacks local context. It lacks the history of conflict, uh, not just going back to 2014, but actually, of course, a lot earlier than that. And the history of imperialism, it is blind, as you've said in, the, in, in your repost to it, to the strategic intentions of the Kremlin. Well, I'm going to get you both to respond to this, because I think this is the, the crux of this debate. Uh, James, what's your view on this? And why did you feel it's so important to respond to this so-called peace letter? There has been a rash of peace proposals from Western experts, retired diplomats, politicians, uh, very senior, for the most part, highly reputable people. And most of them are like the letter in the Financial Times. Most of these proposals are very high-minded, um, but ignore uh, what we know, and we know a great am amount, about Russian objectives and methods. And as you said in your introduction, Jonathan, they're not clear about what they're advocating. Now, I think there's, there are two commonalities in most of these uh, efforts. Uh, leaving aside Putin's peace proposal, in fact, it's a kind of, it's a set of demands. Uh, but I think there are two. The first is that all these people are absolutely convinced and want us to be convinced that there's no way for Ukraine to win this war. Well, I suspect we'll talk about that a bit later, but I think both of us emphatically disagree. I, I, it's not that we are suggesting it's inevitable 
that Ukraine will win this war, that it can't lose the war, but we don't accept that premise. And I don't think Western governments do either. The second is that they all advocate ceasefires uh, yesterday, if not sooner, um, and negotiations. Again, without any specifics as to how negotiations are going to make intractable and issues and incompatible positions somehow less intractable and less incompatible. So um, a lot of us feel, you know, some some precision, some real world context is absolutely uh, necessary in this discussion. What, what concerns you most about the uh, these peace proposals, including the FT one? So, so my uh, intellectual and, and emotional uh, sides of my brain are triggered a bit in a different way, but similar to, to what James said. On one hand, I, 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 am, I am Ukrainian. I've been working in Chatham House for the last 12 years, actually trying to make sure Ukraine is understood in its own words. And I think these external proposals sound... Um, astonishingly patronizing to me uh, in a way of completely denying the agency of Ukraine uh, from day one of, of Russian annexation of Crimea and full-scale invasion three and a half years ago. I think it completely misunderstands the driver uh, of um, this nation to actually ensure that this war ends in a way that the future generation of Ukrainians do not have to die, be raped, tortured by, by the Russian uh, army. And I think fundamentally, uh, a lot of those people hide their fear of Russia uh, by the fear of confronting, actually, this kind of revanchist, very militaristic regime that Putin embodies by appeasing, in a way, him, by giving parts of Ukraine to uh, to his liking in order not to actually face modern day Russia. Uh, Ukrainians stopped fearing Russians. They are looking in a very, you know, you can say cold blooded and rational way on how, how actually this war could be won, not just for Ukraine, but also for Europe. Whereas here in the West, we hear about this fatigue of people who are not actually fighting Russians, who are not uh, daily under bombardments, who do not have to hide their children in basements uh, overnight when the air sirens go on. So I, I think it fundamentally misunderstands and patronizes Ukraine uh, and, and what it has done and is doing today. Jonathan, may I underscore that? Because, Please do, yeah. Because what all these people are doing is consciously or in a subliminal way incorporating a fundamental Russian official premise into their own perceptions and their own proposals, which is that this in the end, um, this is in the end, Ukrainians have nothing to do with these discussions and with ending the war. All of this must be done over the heads. It will be done by the people that matter. It will be done by those I have heard uh, very offensively, uh, a number of meetings referred to as the adults in the room. And, of course, it's for Ukraine's own good. It's for Ukrainians to say what is for Ukraine's own good. It's not for any of us. Uh, but this is another common feature in all of, in, in this, in this, in all of these enterprises. At their worst, and there's quite a few of these, so there's the Nobel Prize winners list that Dmitry Muratov has put together. Um, one should say that I think he still resides in Russia itself, so that has to conform to certain restrictions there. There's that list, there's this peace proposal, there's Orban's peace proposal, there's the Trump team peace proposal, there's Putin's demands as opposed to negotiations. There's all these things floating around. At their heart, the worst of them seems to create a false equivalence between the aggressor and the victim. That also then seems to uh, enshrine one of Russia's propaganda narratives that this is a civil war in which Russia is intervening, as opposed to an act of aggression, which the Russian state has orchestrated from 2014. 
do you think this is looking at you cynically or is there some applied, you know, implied false equivalence? Clearly, um, a lot of these peace proposals are hiding behind the kind of um, misunderstanding of, um, of the nature of this war. We, we can only find solution if we really understand the origins of it. And the origins of it, it's, it's, it's very much in the nature of modern day Russian leadership and the population that has been you know, brainwashed and has been militarized to a degree that we have the largest land war in Europe. I think if we, for a moment, remind ourselves the UN General Assembly vote right at the start of the war, the year year one of the full-scale invasion, I believe it was March, we had an overwhelming support calling Russia to withdraw its troops and calling it an unprovoked aggression, blunt violation of the international law. So coming back to that, all these proposals settle basically in a way of suggesting us to forget, to forget that Russia in a, committed a crime of aggression against peace and is committing that crime on a daily basis since then. It, have, it has expanded to committing war crimes in addition to a general crime against peace by invading Ukraine. And um, that in a way plays into Putin's hand. This plays into Putin's hands by negating that there could be any respect for those rules, that what we have said two and a half years ago could be forgotten as if it didn't exist, because now what has happened? And this is the question of the timing of these proposals. Uh, you know, and then in each, each of them, perhaps somebody is playing more to fears of Trump coming in. Some are just to fears of escalation and direct arms conflict with Russia in Europe. Some are perhaps thinking Ukraine is too feeble even to win, but um, all of them in a way undermine the bedrock of our coexistence as independent nations, respect to sovereign borders. And um, they actually ignore a very important component of, uh, of justice, which is accountability for crime. And this is what, what Russians have been good at kind of um, per, uh, re projecting their impunity uh, and being able to r r run over countries, Georgia, meddling in Moldova, meddling in Armenia, next in Crimea, and there was there's no end to it. Well, in this particular case, there is a quite large global coalition that says there must be an end to Russian impunity. Uh, Jonathan, I mean, just to add the following, the Russian school of diplomacy, the uh, whole Russian information industry, like its Soviet predecessor, um, incorporates a number of insights. And the, one of the main ones is that if you are able to frame the issue, you will then be able to guide the discussion and dictate the conclusion. And what is at work here is an attempt to reframe the issue so that it is not about aggression. It is not about fundamental root and branch violation of the UN Charter. It is not about the egregious violation of the fundamental liberties and rights of states to sovereignty, independence, and uh, defense. It is war itself. It's the old pacifist re refrain. The greatest war crime is war itself. So we have to stop the war. And you know that potentially magnifies your audience, but it just occludes the problem. And uh, that is a, a plainly in many of these proposals, a conscious objective. And I know this isn't on the on the on the topic list, but I'm going to inject a, a one in here for you, uh, James. Um, one of the other Russian narratives, of course, that have cut throughout this, and this unfortunately works with a lot of Russians, even ones who would class themselves as opposition to Putin's uh, regime, and that is to say that fundamentally NATO is either fully to blame for this, or at least 
partially equally to blame uh, for the war. It's NATO aggression, NATO expansion, NATO, you know, arming itself to the teeth, etc. However you want to frame that, there's also this implication here that resolves, absolves Russia, rather, of some of this responsibility. Do you detect any of this sort of sentiment um, in some of these sort of uh, peace initiatives? I can't speak for all these dozens of Nobel laureates, but uh, when it comes to the authors of the letter that prompt, in the FT that prompted ours, I know that every single one of those people uh, fought NATO and believed that NATO at the minimum bears a significant NATO enlargement, at the minimum bears a significant responsibility for what has happened. Now, um, I have, in a number of countries, ad ad addressed this issue in detail. Uh, uh, looking at the diplomatic record, looking at facts, looking at all sorts of things, and keep coming to the conclusion that this factual, factually based arguments about this subject are not going to sway people. Uh, there are more specific pointed facts that have an influence on people. And I'll give you a prime, the primary one. Um, Viktor Yanukovych, when he was president of Ukraine, his first priority was to take the issue of NATO off the table. He, um, he, he ensured that the pro parliament, the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, uh, um, decreed that Ukraine would be a not remain a non-aligned state. Um, and he halted the whole process of NATO integration. What happened in response? The Russians who up until then said EU integration was not a problem, then made it the biggest problem, and then in the end made it a castle spelly. And in the very end, the end of 2013, uh, in a meeting with Putin told Yanukovych that if you don't cease the whole process of integration with the EU and the association agreement with the EU, we will wreck your economy and um, we will annex Crimea. So I can, we, I, we could each give you dozens of examples of this kind. But it's very potent and it's very easy to believe this. It's a very simple message. Unfortunately, a simple, simple distortion of the truth wins out over the truth um, almost every time. Okay, actually, yeah. ties in nicely to what James said about the framing. And I think this is where Russians are, you know, genius in kind of um, spreading this guilt in the West for it's not giving uh, either into Russia's security concerns, respecting Russia's, uh, you know, sphere of influence as a great power surely deserves it, encroaching on its, uh, you know, uh, integral um, um, existential um, uh, rights for for this uh, cordon sanitaire, right? Well. Put it simply, Ukraine does not want to be a cordon sanitaire, as they've imagined uh, uh, in, in the Kremlin. And uh, to me, I, I remember one of the first events in Chatham House after the first bombs dropped in February on Kiev was exactly about that. And it reminds me of Stockholm Syndrome, a victim blaming uh, itself for, for actually a crime. And then this is what Kremlin is consistently doing to Western policymakers, opinion leaders, media, is to inflict this feeling of guilt so that they can put it simply blackmail with all kinds of tools they have at their disposal to abandon Ukraine, to scale down on assistance, to provide it very slowly, or even better, to stop it at all. The Russians understand uh, what they see as the greatest weakness of the West, which is self-doubt. It's, it's part of our postmodern civilization, blaming oneself and self-doubt. And uh, so, of course, there, there are a thousand and one ways of exploiting it. But I, that is plainly what we're dealing with here. And of course, this this idea of a sanitary zone, a, a buffer plays into the other narrative that Russia needs security. And, you know, I saw an article by Simon Jenkins that very much, uh, 
you know, regurgitates that kind of stuff about Russia having a right to security. The irony being that this week, um, Putin has announced that they have got a sanitary zone, sanitary uh, zone, but it's in Bilgorod. And they've essentially turned the frontline obelisk into a sanitary zone, not perhaps what he originally uh, envisaged there. But let's turn to the detail, if indeed there is any detail in these peace proposals, if they were followed through. And we know that Ukrainian government would, would have trouble if it did follow these. We'll come to that later. But if the letter and spirit of these peace proposals was followed, what are the implications? Could Russia declare a victory? And in fact, would it be a major victory for Russia in the short term? I think, forgive me, I think it's an unreal question. Ukraine would have to be coerced to follow this course of action. Russia so far has not coerced it to do so. So is the West going to coerce it to do so? Um, I think it's more profitable. And I know you have raised, you want to raise this question to focus on what Russia's motives are for supporting this activity, but also uh, more recently, tabling its own official peace proposal. Um, uh, I, I, it's, although it is interesting, I think it's not necessarily the most important point that the timing of Putin's peace proposal uh, just preceded the um, enormous uh, Swiss conclave that Ukraine had extensively prepared and was clearly designed to overshadow it. But I think there are, um, I think there are other reasons. I think, first of all, as Arisia has said, he could see the West's fatigue with the war and is trying to establish just how many people will respond positively, uh, despite the flatly unacceptable conditions that he that, that he set down. But I also have another thought about it. Um, I think one reason. Putin wants the West and Ukraine to sign on to a ceasefire is that his armed forces need a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. And I explain this in the following way. For six months, formally speaking, but in practice longer than that, Ukraine received no military assistance from the United States at all. Um, how did the battle lines change during that long period? Hardly at all. Now, that is not good news. Uh, and if the weaponry were really to start flowing again, what would the consequences then be? So I think in these conditions, a ceasefire would be very profitable. Um, to uh, President Putin and to Russia. And then ask another question. Let's somehow make all sorts of heroic assumptions and assume all this were to come to pass and we had a ceasefire. And then we sat down and negotiated about X, Y, and Z. Though I have to note that with Putin's terms, there are conditions for the ceasefire, unlike the others. Uh, really, his ceasefire would be ratifying a surrender. But let us assume that we have a ceasefire and then a negotiation. Well, we know one thing. Ukraine is not going to put an end to that ceasefire because it is, uh, of no, about for no other reason, it's dependent on the West and um, it is uh, doing everything possible to secure as many much support outside the West. And it would uh, be, uh, suffer immediate and deep opprobrium if it were to violate the ceasefire. But Putin could violate it at his will. And what will the consequences be? Exactly what we've seen before. And exactly what we've seen over the 10-year Minsk process. Uh, impotent finger wagging. Calls for both sides to respect the terms, blah, blah, blah. 
So uh, this gives him all the flexibility, but it deprives Ukraine of any. I think there's one fundamental thing that a lot of people who are putting these proposals forget, that Putin is not just at war with Ukraine. It is clear the way he is restructuring his armed forces, that he is actually at war with the West. It's not a full kinetic war the way it is right now with Ukraine. But it is clear that Putin wants United States out of Europe. Putin wants Europe divided. And he wants to roam free. Uh, he wants to, to ba basically define terms of uh, energy, of uh, information, of his own influence uh, in Europe. And uh, what he wants to achieve, or what he fails to achieve militarily, which he does, as Jane describes, he wants to achieve at the so-called negotiating table. For Putin, negotiations is just an extension of a military strategy, not the other way around, not the replacement of it. And something I just want to recall again, bringing back more Ukrainian uh, no, nerve to this, it is all, Ukraine has been through means process for uh, almost five and a half years. It has been through various inter iterations and more than 200 rounds of negotiations that included intermediaries, that included Paris and Berlin, and at some earlier stages, even United States and Brussels, which were all futile. Why? Because Putin wants at best case, or at worst case for him, for Ukraine to have limited sovereignty. But now, with a full-scale war, he doesn't want Ukraine to exist as an independent state. Ukraine has to be, you know, subsumed by the Russian Federation, become some kind of southern uh, Malorossia of the, of the Russian um, federal state. And he will be the, the master of the supranational, uh, you know, country that will include Belarus, Ukraine, hopefully Moldova, and in the future, some Central Asian countries. This is his legacy. This is his project. So I think if, Jonathan, as you asked, we see a lousy deal on the ground, we should all be very worried. I mean, maybe Ukrainians will get a break from war, but we will not get a break from war because uh, Russia is increasing military spending, whereas in the West, actually, we have a quite, um, you know, dynamic of people not willing to invest in defense. We are sleepwalking into a, a you know, a frozen uh, defense spending. And even with the war in Ukraine, I, I looked at the ECFR uh, polling, very few countries, it's mainly Poland and, you know, Baltic states that public supporting increased defense spending. In Italy, only 9, 10% of people support. In Spain, it's very low. It's, it's, it's even in UK, it's only 30%. At times when we have such large war in Europe, so to be honest, we should be arming and you know and and asking Ukraine to evict Russians from its territory to inflict a defeat on Russian army because it's good for us and it's good for Russia in a way. We could talk about it as well, and um, and I think Ukraine has created an astounding opportunity on the battlefield by resisting for so long to actually ensure some kind of different security architecture once this war is over, over on good terms. Because if we, so to speak, fudge it right now, we'll be in a bigger trouble in the future. May I add one necessary dim dimension? As we speak, Russia is waging what we inadequately call a hybrid war against the West. And I am still very depressed when I hear senior people in the West discuss it because I don't think they've connected the dots and fully understood what they are dealing with. We are not just dealing with propaganda and disinformation, although the level of disinformation, the whole info war is enormous. We are dealing with penetration intimidation, disruption, sabotage, assassination, and not just in border areas. We have had factories producing weapons in the UK go up in flames. We have had GPS systems interfered with. We have had electricity and energy cables cut. 
all of this is going on and all we seem to know how to what to do, how to do in, in response I, is talk about it. I'm not even, as I said at the beginning, I don't think we do know how to talk about it because we are not connecting it. It's not simply that these are efforts to continually test the West. These are efforts that are very similar to what the Russians call the initial period of war. They're a way of shaping the battlefield before a kinetic war starts. So when I look at this, it reinforces a point, which Russia did make at some point, that Russia um, does view Ukraine as the center of gravity in a state of war with the West, most of which is below the threshold of Article 5 and kinetic warfare. But my point would simply be this. If Russia accomplishes its objectives or is seen to accomplish its objectives, I think the country I'm living in, speaking from Estonia, much of Central Europe, the Baltic region, some others, will immediately see um, an escalation of all these kinds of activities. And the rest of Europe will gradually see it as well. So these things, these things very much link up. And the Russians, of course, will be watching our responses. And the other implied element of these uh, peace treaties, which I think you've you've really sort of uh, you know mentioned here, is that they have this vision that at the end of this peace negotiation, whatever it is, you have a state of stasis, balance, and a complete cessation of hostility. You have something called peace. First, I want to address this to to Arisia because. First of all, as James has said, Putin's regime, his education system, is now teaching a generation of Russians that they exist in a state of perpetual warfare. It's preparing them not just to fight, but to the idea that dying for the Kremlin strategy is a noble, indeed inevitable thing. So the idea of uh, peace as such seems incompatible with the direction of travel in Russia. But also there's this question of all the people that would be left behind in Luhansk, Donetsk. And if Putin gets his hands on Zaporizhia and Kharkiv Oblast, you're talking about many, many hundreds of thousands of people who will know no peace because they will be living in essentially a, a territory which has become nothing more or less than an outsourced gulag, an area of terror, impunity, torture and lawlessness. So I know there's two sort of issues there. The idea of perfect peace and the imperfect reality that we are faced with. I think that, um, look, Ukraine know what it's fighting for, for from day one. Ukraine is fighting a defensive war, which is an enormous advantage. And uh, Ukraine is mobilizing more resources, men and women to, uh, so far, defend the front line and eventually prepare for an, an offensive operation. Th this is clear. And, and, and uh, I think, you know, one of the calculations that Putin had was that, that Ukraine will also tire from within. And it, it, indeed, the war takes a huge toll on Ukraine because it's a total war. It's not a classic war where, you know, the army is just meeting on the battlefield. Um, you know, Putin is, is basically shut, is trying to shut off Ukrainian energy system, energy grid for, for the upcoming winter. And that not only means trouble in the cities and residential, imagine not having, you know, electricity in London, right? Uh, or having it only for two, three days, uh, day, days uh, two, three hours per day. He is undermining Ukrainian economy in this way. He is trying to create a new wave of refugees into Europe uh, and, and to uh, kind of fuel the, uh, the extreme right uh, against the support for Ukraine. So all of this is taking place. But what we see right now in Ukraine, the resolve and the fortitude maintains. Ukraine is trying to produce more kits, drones, uh, armored vehicles, what it can. Uh, and it, I think this is why Putin is suing for peace, because time is not playing in his favor right now. We do have 
slow but uh, you know steady rearmament in the West. We do have a uh, clear understanding, uh, at least in the military establishment and security, that Russia is a threat. And um, we do see Europe, we put America aside at this point, um, really uh, uh, trying to build its own capability to deter and uh, support Ukraine as much as it can. Um, it's not saying we're going to abandon Ukraine. These ideas are not coming from, you know, official capitals. These are independent academics or, you know, policy wants, right? So what we have to understand is that um, inside Ukraine right now, yes, uh, more than 50% still believe that Ukraine can win and can reclaim the territory. There is a group of people as well, roughly 45% who say, okay, if Ukraine has to lose some territory because it is not supplied, it, of course, it cannot completely um, uh, fight Russia on its own, then the deal has to include membership of NATO, membership in the European Union, and security, that, that security arrangement within NATO, that collective security that can guarantee uh, more deterrence that can, in a way, uh, um, ensure Ukraine is not alone of a, an eventual Russian violation of, of, of a ceasefire or peace settlement. And, and this is the situation. Ukraine is not willing right now to take a peace at any price. The peace is understood in the way of hardcore security that is ukrainian armed forces are capable to do their job but it ha is also embedded in the collective security first um i mean what is implicit in a lot of what we've said up to now about western thinking is that unfortunately there is a state of mind in the west that views peace in therapeutic terms. Um, and whereas peace simply means an absence of fighting, and then one has to ask an absence of what kind of fighting and in exchange for what exactly. Um, and there is a discussion that the, the, the principal proponents of ending the war don't seem to want to have. The, um, the the very big issue which arises from all of this and which is brought out by Arisia's last observations is that somehow we have got ourselves into a position where uh, we adopt the premise that as long as Russia does not launch a kinetic attack on a NATO ally. Um, they are at liberty to do anything in Ukraine, uh, making the entire country uninhabitable if necessary, flattening all its cities, maybe killing a million or two million people, who knows? Uh, driving half the people out of the country so that its population, which now is already full and fallen at a drastic rate, um, uh, falls below the 10 million mark. Uh, and they could do this safe in the knowledge that uh, no NATO country is going to directly intervene. Now, what sort of said, what sort of precedence does this create for uh, not simply European security, but global governance? In 2010, when NATO had a strategic concept, which I call NATO strategic concepts as its pluses and minuses, and there were two key paragraphs in there which stipulated that there are cases where conflicts outside Europe can affect fundamental in, the fundamental interests of NATO. Well, in the last strategic concept in 2022, those paragraphs were removed. Now, you know, the implications of that, I think, are very serious, and we are looking at them. And 
it so I would say not only is our reticence explaining the inadequacy of what we are doing, it is directly fueling the conflict. It is making it vastly worse. I have enormous doubt as to whether Ukraine is capable now of, even with our support, of bringing off some kind of meaningful victory. But I have no doubt in saying that had we done what we easily could have done in 2022 in our military uh, supplies to Ukraine, that we would be in a very different place today and the Russians would be um, uh, um, staring at defeat. And, and I mean, uh, just one more point, because it comes back to this notion of the inevitability of a Russian victory. China today is supplying the Russian defense industry with 70% of its machine tools and 90% of its microelectronics and more than one intelligence service in the Western world has concluded, come to a fairly obvious conclusion, looking at that and other factors, that if the Chinese stopped assisting Russia, its own defense industry would be on the point of collapse. No, I you know, one, you not underestimate the toll this has taken on Russia. But Russia is led by a group of people who fundamentally don't care as long as they can wage war, they will do so. And the only thing that will affect their calculation is if they see the West is determined to raise the game and stop it. And Orisi, this is interesting because, of course, Ukrainians do not have this desire to normalize the situation. They do not want to believe in the fairy tales, which unfortunately some seem to cling on to, of this idea of perfect peace and so on. Ukrainians see uh, Russia's actions. Um, many of them will be able to understand the propaganda in the original and and and, and have an insight into the mindset. They also have another foot in the West and they can see Western vacillation and weakness as well. If a Ukrainian government was to acquiesce to this peace, and again, as James said, this is highly theoretical, it's unlikely to actually happen. But if the Ukrainian government was to acquiesce in an imperfect peace, surely that would be the end of that politician's career and would likely prompt something like a, another Maidan or something similar. Well, surely, uh, what Ukrainians want and what is what we see in you know in anecdotal evidence in public opinion, there's a there's a basically determination to defeat Russia, and the discussion is how best to do it. This is the democratic debate, if you want, in the wartime Ukraine. And if you see some of the public support for Zelensky falling, it is partially because he is not actually preparing a midterm to long term strategy, putting a country more on a war footing in terms of economy, in terms of um, use of resources, in terms of mobilization, how it was done and organized. It's, it doesn't mean Ukrainians want more war, but Ukrainians understand that they have to be self-reliant. And that is to a degree a healthy uh, you know, assessment, because if Ukrainians, you know, we would see were totally dependent on the West, would just, you know, be in, in despair because what is looming, you know, in Washington. I think clearly Putin and these power peace proposals would have a much better chance. Um, and and uh, clearly, um, I, I don't think there could be any leader of uh, democratic and independent Ukraine that would concede, first of all, territory that has not been conquered militarily. This is what Putin wants. Two, that would agree to any kind of limitations on Ukraine's future security arrangement, right? Because this war is not just about, you know, 500 square kilometers somewhere in the steps of the, of the south or even Crimea. This war is about where Ukraine geostrategically belongs. And last but not least, you know, Ukrainians... Um, Ukrainians know Russian from inside much better than people in the West. They understand that it's colossus and clay feet. They understand the smoke screen 
that the Russians are, you know, uh, putting here in the West to inflict fear and manipulate and frame issues. They see those Russian soldiers. They see Russian equipment. Yes, they are adapting. Yes, they're investing a lot. And that's why their GDP is growing. But the uh, Ukraine's war uh, ending uh, theory includes technological revolution. Ukraine is not planning to, you know, win over Russia head on. And that is why we see the quite creative approach to warfare that NATO will be now learning after establishing this train, joint training and analysis center in Poland, because it's the future of war unfolding, you know, as we speak. And um, th that is why no leader of Ukraine at this point could uh, bring a deal along the lines as proposed in, in those letters. And it's been said, uh, amongst others, by Keir Giles, who's usually uh, right on these matters, that you cannot negotiate with Russia unless it's from the prism of a catastrophic defeat that they've undergone or from a position of extreme strength. At the moment, we seem to be highly reactive and from Russia's perspective, not creating that high ground from which to negotiate with on the Ukrainian side. What needs to change? What do we need to do to put the requisite pressure on Russia and to allow Ukraine to be able to negotiate from a position of strength? I'll fire this at you first, James, and then I'll give you a chance to respond, Arisia. Well, I will not be the first person you've spoken to uh, who will respond to that question um, with a curious question of my own, which I think is preoccupying Putin increasingly by the day. What will Trump's response be? And um, you know, the clear answer is, as of now, we don't know what is in his peace plan. But increasingly, we have a pretty good idea. And uh, there are elements of it, which, of course, he, uh, was, we know, and Arisia possibly knows more than I do. He had uh, just, I think, two days ago, a long discussion with President Zelensky. Um, I'm quite confident from everything I hear. The Ukrainians were very pleased and a bit surprised by that conversation. Trump does not want this to be a forever war. His, the security people around him, and there's quite a spectrum of thinking there, I have to say, some of it quite frightening, some of it, uh, to my mind, deeply reassuring. Uh, there is, um, yeah, they are, they know, they're certain of one thing, as am I, if someone like Biden is reelected, we will see a continuation of what we have. I don't think there'll be any changes of any significant kind, which to my mind means it's a strategy. Uh, it's not designed this way, but it's a strategy that unwittingly will ensure that Ukraine slowly and steadily loses. Um, and the Trump is not going to do that. I think he's going to deliver very unpalatable ultimator to Zelensky about the concessions he expects him to make, and similarly to Putin. And if they agree to something on those lines, and Putin, as he's endemically inclined to do, then shifts the ground or won't agree to it in the first place, Trump has been very clear more than once in private conversations. We will then give Ukraine absolutely everything we have and everything they need. Now, you know, I mean, this is the plot thickens and becomes more interesting by the day. I, I'm very agnostic about all of this, but we're doomed to live beginning next year in even more interesting times than we're living in now. Not a genuine one, but it certainly it's been said that that is a, a curse in Chinese, although I think that is apocryphal. Uh, Arisia, what's your what's your view on this? But I think you asked Jonathan, you know, how how, how can there be um, 
a clear message for Putin as well, rather than these kind of false hopes that are voiced in the letters. Um, I think, first of all, we need a strategy. And that, that is, right now, I mean, for, the, for most of this period of war, we had more of a crisis management approach where White House especially was trying to ensure there is no you know, interstate war and the, especially war between the great powers and that the war that is now taking place on Ukraine's territory stays there. Okay, so that, that they've been doing everything to to ensure that and they've been successful from that point of view. The conflict is contained. Ukraine is slowly inflicting quite a lot of, you know, destruction to Russian army. It's just, it's been a good, you know, a cost per cost per benefit cost analysis. If you do it, you know, destroy 25% of the Russian Black Sea fleet is now actually doesn't have dominance in Crimea, destroyed half of conventional, you know, ground force, pretty good, but it's not good for Ukraine, right? And, it, and we have not, you know, the game is not over as we speak. Uh, and I think we need to change that mantra, you know, we will support Ukraine for as long as it takes. I think it should be actually what Joseph Borrell said in Ukrainian parliament. He said we should do whatever it takes for Ukraine to win. And I would add as fast as possible. Because, you know, the, the, the world has many, many other issues to deal with. And, and it's not getting, you know, it's not, it's not getting more livable in a way. So, um, and, and I think that means that, of course, um, understanding the nature of Russian regime, and we're coming back to perhaps the beginning of why this letter was so misleading, is because it intentionally or unintentionally misinterprets the nature of modern day Russia, its objectives towards Ukraine and towards the West, and, um, and, and actually staying in it, um, uh, being being actually, you know, very lucky to have Ukraine as a fighting partner because Western soldiers are not on the ground and, and Ukraine is doing the hard job daily uh, and, and helping Ukraine to train, procure timely and supply timely military kit. And, and I think only when Russians will feel that it's not just the, the rhetoric, it's not just the statements, but it's actually backed by real resources that are on the ground in Ukraine, that are not in some kind of ledger of Pentagon or uh, Bundeswehr. They are actually on the ground. They are, they are really you know, nervous about F-16s arriving. They are really nervous about long-range missiles. It's not going to make their life easier. Uh, and, and, and I think only then there will be um, a, a genuine negotiation, if you want, of what do they have to give in order not to lose with shame and in order to save some of their or consolidate some of their gains. And whatever it takes, surely that should also include tightening the squeeze on the throat of the Russian economy, blocking the grey uh, fleets that are transporting Russian oil, uh, preventing Russia from from sort of generating income to power its aggression. Are these seen as overly provocative or just to conclude here, to put Ukraine in a strong negotiating position, do we have to look at every aspect of weakening Russia, not just conventional battlefield uh, techniques? Well, most certainly, Jonathan. That's why I was discussing the whole hybrid aspect of things and uh, what's called um, grey zone warfare. The only thing that provokes Russia, the only two things that provoke Russia, are uh, weakness and bluff. And we're not suggesting either. It's one thing if we... It's one thing if we end up concluding we don't know how to put a stop to a particular malign practice um the uh, of the russians but quite another thing to say well we do but it could be risky and highly inconvenient and uncomfortable and upset a lot of apple carts as i look at this whole equation i think i see mixtures of the two here and we've got to move that needle where we do first of all 
everything we can to cut off Russia's revenue streams, in my view, everything we can to respond in ways that Russia would find deeply uncomfortable to hybrid attacks and understand and do this with this, with this uh, having a strategy whose aim must be to alter Russia's calculations about the benefits of this type of behavior. And those components, unfortunately, today are lacking. I think also Putin is doing a poker face, trying us to play the game he wants rather than the game that is in our own interest, well, right? And then this is why, you know, these proposals play into actually feeding these false hopes that I'm sure the current uh, master of the Kremlin ha uh, uh, harnishes so much. So, you know, in a way, I think there's there are many unknowns. It's true. Many unknowns, but I think in situations like that, it's it's advisable to do what is right, and we know what is right. We know who is the aggressor. We know who is the victim. We know where the international recognized borders of Ukraine are, and for the same matter of Russia are. So why don't we bring back Russia to the official recognized international borders? That's a very powerful place to end. I'm massively grateful to you both, Arisa Lutsevich, OBE, and James Sher, OBE. Thank you so much for joining us. Incredibly powerful statements. I hope activists watch this and will retweet and share these and put pressure on the representatives to change Western policy and help Ukraine to win. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks Thank you. for an excellent discussion. Excellent conversation. Thank you, Jonathan.